Father, we want to give you the glory you do. Jesus, we want to see you in all your glorious work for us, your death and resurrection, your present work for us. Holy Spirit, uh, we want to be full of your presence. So teach us. Help us to bow before the word of God, to accept it, to uh, hear it with humble hearts, Lord, and to take it with us today when we leave into our whole week. Amen. Well, I want to know, uh, have you ever been caught in like a really bad storm? I don't mean like, you know, you just kind of like watch a bad storm. But have you ever been caught in a storm that you could not get away from and you were genuinely scared? Anyone? Yeah, I can think of one or two times in my life when that was, that was true. Uh, what was your first instinct when you were caught in that storm? Did you write a song of praise about it? Probably not. You were like, I hope I live past today. Dear Lord, please save me. <laughs> right? Like, your instinct was not to write a song of praise about it. But here the psalmist, David, writes a song of praise to God in the midst of a really bad thunderstorm. That's the setting for Psalm 29. Charles Spurgeon, when he wrote on Psalm 29, the great preacher uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, Just as the eighth psalm is to be read by moonlight when the stars are bright, as the nineteenth psalm needs the rays of the rising sun to bring out its beauty, so this psalm can best be rehearsed beneath the black wing of tempest, by the glare of the lightning, or amid that dubious dusk which heralds the war of elements. The verses march to the tune of thunderbolts. God is everywhere conspicuous, and all the earth is hushed by the majesty of his presence. You might have heard as we uh, sang and chanted Psalm 29 that there were some thunderbolts in there, the way that Mac played that, right? This is a thunderous psalm. And you know, that's really one of the great things about the psalms. The more that you open them, the more that you learn to pray through them, um, they train us how to actually speak about God and speak to God. If I were to write a psalm, it would go something like this. It would, it would go, it was a very nice morning, and I was on my back porch, and I was having a cup of coffee, and all the kids were being quiet. Amen. Right? Like, that's the psalm that I would write. But that's not true to life. <laughs> right? All the time. Like, that's not every day of life. And, and the psalms uh, teach us how to know God in the midst of our world. And, and here in this psalm, in Psalm 29, we are confronted and we're comforted by the God whose voice and power are greater than a storm. We're confronted and we're comforted by the living God, not the God of our own choosing. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the God we've come here to worship today and to praise. Amen? So this psalm is going to teach us about how to praise and live for and love the living God. We're going to go through the psalm just very simply. The psalm is broken down into three parts. It's verses 1 to 2, it's verses 3 to 8, and it's verses 9 to 10. That's the basic construction of the psalm. Let's look at verses 1 to 2 first. And I've called this Trinitarian glory in heaven. By the way, uh, my, my um, title did not make it into the, uh, into the bulletin, but it's the psalmist dances with lightning bolts. I thought it was good. Uh, so Trinitarian glory in heaven, verses 1 to 2. This psalm begins in heaven, and it moves to earth. Let's read. Ascribe unto the Lord, O you mighty. Ascribe unto the Lord worth and strength. Give the Lord the honor due unto his name, and worship the Lord with holy worship. When it says, O worship the Lord, O you mighty. The mighty ones of heaven are being called to praise God. And look very carefully. What does it say? It says, ascribe, and then ascribe. And then look at the beginning of verse 2. It says, give. That's actually the same word. So it's ascribe, ascribe, ascribe. Give, recognize, see God for who he is, and then give him worship. Holy worship and strength. What does that remind you of? Well, that is so Trinitarian. 
Ascribe, 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 because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The thrice holy call of Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, which Jackie read to, for us, is matched by the thr thrice repeated call to ascribe to God the worship and praise that is His alone. On Trinity Sunday, we come and we call all to celebrate with us not so much what God has done, but who God is. Psalm 29, you notice, is pure praise. There's no other exhortation in the psalm. People are not called to do anything else but the one fundamental thing of worshiping God. In fact, God's name, every time you see in the psalm, look at the psalm again, when you see LORD in all caps, that's the name of God, Yahweh. It's in there 18 times. This psalm is all about knowing and worshiping the Trinitarian God. With the call to ascribe, let's think about this, to give, to recognize. You know what this psalm highlights? It highlights that humanity's problem is actually this, that we do not know or worship God. That's what Romans 1 says. The fundamental problem in humanity is that we do not give God the glory He is due. We do not ascribe to God the, 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 the worship and give Him the worth that He is due. Trinity Sunday is not to be relegated to the dusty corners of theology. As Glenn Scrivener says, the doctrine of the Trinity is Christianity for dummies. It is Christianity 101. And by that he means not that it's like easy to understand, but that it's the first thing to understand. If we do not know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do not know God. We do not know Him as He has revealed Himself to be. The Trinity is the foundation for everything else we believe so that we do not make a God of our own image, but instead we worship the living God. Trinitarian Christianity is simply this, learning to know the true and the living God. And I'll add this too. You should not look at the Trinity as something that like gets tacked onto the end of the Bible. It's there the whole way through. And that black day it cries, holy, holy, holy. Because the Trinity is the one who wrote the scriptures end to end and has revealed himself in them from end to end. That's why we pray the glory of Patri. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, right? After the psalm. Because it speaks of him. It speaks of him. And Jesus, of course, said what? The psalms speak of me, right? So let's move to verses 3 to 8. This is all about the God who speaks louder than the storm. So the psalm begins in heaven, but then it moves to earth. Read verse 3 with me. It is the Lord that commands the waters. It is the glorious God that makes the thunder. And here the psalmist David appears to be watching a thunderstorm move from north to south over the land of Israel. He, watch it, he watches it moves from the waters of the Mediterranean Sea away to the desert in the south. The psalmist sees God's power revealed in the thunderstorm, yes. But he also knows that God is over the thunderstorm and infinitely more powerful than the storm itself. In 2004, I can remember uh, traveling down to my parents' house after there in my hometown. Uh, poor Charlotte uh, took a direct hit from Hurricane Charlie. I don't know if any of you remember that hurricane. Um, it was something to see. As Brooke and I traveled down southbound on 70, you got to a point where there were no more pine trees. They had been cut down like blades of grass are cut down. They were simply gone. They were like pulverized. There was, you know, if you, if you go down 70 in Florida, if you've ever been on that highway, you know, there's pine trees everywhere. And they were just gone. And they were, they were leveled. There was nothing uh, but palmettos. The forest was stripped bare, just like verse 8 says. But here the psalmist knows a greater power. And what is central in verses 3 to 8 is not the storm. Again, not the storm itself, but something else. And what is it? It's the voice. The voice of God. 
It's the voice of God that's more powerful than the storm. That's the centerpiece of these verses. And even the phrase in Hebrew, kol Yehovah, sounds like thunder. It's kind of like an onomatopoeia. Uh, Beethoven has a piece in his pastoral. And really, this illustration is just for John Broman. I'm sure he's the only one who might know this. But he has a piece in his pastoral that's supposed to sound like thunder. And it's, like, it's supposed to mimic a thunderstorm. And the whole psalm mimics the sound of a thunderstorm. Uh, seven times the phrase, Kol Yehovah, appears here. And biblically, that's the number of perfection and fullness. Put simply, in this psalm, we are confronted by the God who wonderfully and powerfully speaks. That's one of his defining qualities in this psalm, is that he is able to speak and speak more powerfully than even a thunderstorm. His speaking is his doing. In the beginning, God did what? He spoke creation into being, and it was. And most of all, he is so powerful and sovereign that he's able to give us the word of the scriptures. Because our God speaks, we have a Bible in our hand. That's it. That's what you should believe about the Bible. Because our God speaks, you have a Bible in your hand. That's how it works. And if we want to know the powerful voice of our God, here's where we ought to be. Actually, this is a prayer book. So uh, in, in, the, in that Bible, in the pew, that's where we ought to look, right? Because our God speaks, we have a Bible. It's as simple as I can put it. And most of all, above all, of course, we have the word of his incarnate son, right? Not just words on a page, but flesh and blood, divine and human, our Lord Jesus Christ. As Pastor Joseph Carl says, there is far more royal power in the thunder of the word than in the word of thunder. It is the word of our God that shows himself as the living God. In fact, if you, if you tore the Bible and you were to look at what is the distinguishing mark between the living God and all false gods, what is it again and again? It is that the living God actually speaks. He's not deaf and dumb and made in our image. No, no, he makes himself known and he speaks. Now, you know, that's one of the sad things about the pluralism that's so rampant in our day. Many gods, many ways. That's what we hear, to simplify it down, right? Many gods, many ways. But if we buy that, we're being inoculated to hearing and responding to the word of the one true and living God. The one true and living God who has actually made himself known, who has come to humanity and revealed who he is. And that's the Holy Trinity, as I was telling the children earlier. He is not a God of our making. No, again, he speaks, he makes himself known, and we are called, as verse 2 says, to bring the holy worship he deserves in and through Jesus Christ. I suppose that's the other connection to Trinity Sunday. In this psalm, we're confronted with the God who so sovereignly reveals himself. He speaks for himself. He comes, for example, to Moses and he says what? I am that I am, Moses. So if you're looking to come here today and to comprehend the Trinity, you'll be disappointed. We're not going to comprehend the Trinity today. But we may apprehend it. We may join the psalmist in worshiping even if we can't get our mind around the Trinity. Indeed, if we're talking about God, if we're talking about the living God, you should expect not to get your mind around it. Amen? Otherwise, we're not talking about God. We're talking some, about something that humans have invented. Put differently, the Trinity must not be for us a wall we slam our mind against, but rather an ocean that we are invited to swim in. Right? That's what the psalmist is doing. He is swimming in an ocean of worship. The psalmist is swimming and adoring. What does he say in verse 8? How does that section end? In his temple all cry glory. It ends in worship. Uh, some actually think that this was written 
to be, uh, to be sung in the temple during a, a thunderstorm. That as the thunderstorm was going over Israel, they would worship in the temple. It's a beautiful picture of what we're meant to do with our knowledge of the living God. We're not meant to get our mind around it. We're meant to worship for who he is, because he is God. But look how the psalm ends. I love this. Verses 9 to 10. Peace in the last. Peace in the last. Knowing the God who sits over the storm. Let's go ahead and read verses 9 to 10 again. The Lord sits above the flood waters, and the Lord remains king forever. The Lord shall give strength to his people, and the Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. Can you hear the hush in those verses? The storm has passed, and God's people are safe. I might be crazy here. You can tell me if I am later. But haven't you, as a Christian, experienced these verses? Haven't you heard the blast of thunder and the white heat of lightning and yet somehow felt safe? Haven't you known that in your life? Maybe I'm crazy. Haven't you felt awed by who God is, at least as he's revealed in creation, at least he's he's, he's revealed in thunderstorms? Haven't you felt awed but safe? In verses 9 to 10, the storm passes, but God remains. The psalm ends not with ruin, not with destruction, which is how we might think it might end, especially when you're talking about floodwaters, but with strength and peace. Why is that? Why is that? Well, verse 9 specifically mentions those floodwaters again. And let's look at this real quick. In the Old Testament, floodwaters are a sign both of judgment on sin. We can easily think of the example there, right? Noah and the flood. And the chaos of evil. So, the ju- judgment on sin and the chaos of evil. And for the Christian, what has happened? We have already passed out of judgment and chaos. We have no longer to fear judgment in our relationship to God because it's been dealt with by the blood of Jesus. We do not fear the judgment that everyone must undergo before God. Not because of, of who we are, but because of who our God is. Because our God has provided the means so that the floodwaters will not rise over our head. And that in the day of judgment, we will stand in Christ. The words of the Gloria and Excelsius, which we sung earlier, match the journey of Psalm 29 exactly. Glory to God in the highest, and what? Peace to his people on earth. Furthermore, Revelation 4 tells us that sin and evil in our world, I would say even thunderstorms and hurricanes, what we would call natural evil, will be dealt with. Look, at, look in Revelation 4, what happens around God's throne? The floodwaters are turned into a sea of glass, smooth as crystal. They are no more to raise their head against God. They are dealt with. They have been calmed. Sin and evil have been smoothed out. Smooth as glass. Now, I'll end here. As I said again earlier, we should always remember to pray, as we pray the songs, that they speak of Christ and find fulfillment in Him. Anytime you're reading the Psalms, you should think, how does this relate to Jesus? How did Jesus fulfill this? How is Jesus speaking through this? Here's the thought I want us to end with today. The trust and faith of David the psalmist. The trust and faith of the Christian. Trusting God through the storm. Being awed but safe. Do you know where they find fulfillment? They find fulfillment on the lips of Jesus. Do you remember... A circumstance, a story in the life of Christ involving a storm. Well, the words of this psalm find fulfillment in the words of the fully human and the fully divine lips of Jesus who also spoke to the storm. And what did he say? Peace be still. And they obeyed. That's it. This psalm finds fulfillment on his lips when the wind and the waves obeyed the one who came in our flesh, fully human, fully divine.
Friends, this is why Trinity Sunday matters. This is why the Trinity matters. And that is the promise of Psalm 29 for the Christian. I pray that it's yours today and you take this psalm with you throughout your whole week. Amen. I'm going to give you a moment to simply just respond to the Lord uh, and worship Him silently, pray silently using Psalm 29. And then we're going to confess a very long prayer together. (laughs) 